uh, over Mosul, but not here physically. Um, we had a short discussion at the beginning of our session talking about different ways of defining religion. And uh, your colleagues here have defined religion as a set of beliefs that lead to practices. And the point of those practices is that these will generate a reward. This reward can be spiritual, it can occur in an afterlife, but it can also occur in this life. It can either be material rewards, things will do, you'll pass your exams, you'll make money, or it can be the kinds of rewards of self-fulfillment, experiential reward. And um, they further added that these relig that religions tend also to be justified by an authority that um, rules through a set of laws and inspires people through fear, in part, fear. Um, they've also observed that one of the key features that differentiates um, uh, monotheistic religions from other religions is that they are transportable that they will survive being transported into a different culture. And this raises several key issues about how religion differs from culture and about how we might, um, about whether our definitions of religion are exclusive or whether they are inclusive. So that whether, uh, whether um, a phenomenon needs to fit all of the criteria to be a religion or whether it only fits some of them. And we talk through the list provided by Ninian Smart on um, the features of religion. He defines religion as something that has doctrine, myth and narrative, something that has ethics, something that uses ritual, something that generates emotions, something that has a hierarchy, and something that has a distinctive kind of aesthetic. Um, we've suggested that some religions certainly have all of these, um, and many of what we call world religions do. Certainly the Abrahamic religions, such as Judaism, Islam, Christianity, have um, all of these. But what do we do with religions that don't? That's an interesting question. And can religions acquire more? Can, can there be uh, religions that have some of these features that acquire more of them to make themselves a proper religion? So this, this you know, this issue of defining religion gets to the core, of, that gets to the heart of the notion of how the categorization of religion changes from generation to generation. Who decides what religion is? Who decides what appropriate criteria for comparison? So I want to talk to you today about a um, a specific case study of a religion that has become more religion-like over the last 50 years. That is, that, is, that is a form of religion that started to look more like a world religion, that looked more like Islam and Christianity. And that is um, the religion practiced on the island of Bali. It's sometimes called Balinese Hinduism, um, but for current purposes, I'm going to call it Balinese religion. And this is explored in a classic article by the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, which is on your Moodle site, and I invite you all to have a look at. What I'm going to do now is summarize what the key points of this article are, and invite a bit of discussion about that at the end, and how it relates to what we've been talking about before. And um, Geertz starts off with the definitions used by the sociologist Max Weber, who you may well have heard of. And Weber divides all religions into two parts. He says religions can be segmented or they can be systematized. That is, he says religions can deal with individual forms of behavior. So they can say, um, you know, don't charge up your mobile phone, it's wrong. Or they can be systematized. They can have a set of philosophies that justify individual moral instructions and relate moral instructions to one another. Don't charge up mobile phones, it uses up lots of electricity, and that has to be paid for by the poor, so it's oppressive. It's a way of systematizing an individual moral instruction. So that's one of the big differentiations that Weber makes. Are you making individual instructions that need no rationalization? Or do you rationalize what you're doing and relate individual moral instructions to one another? Um, related to that, it's a second 
differentiation. Is this a religion that is amoral, or is it moral? Does it describe ideal behaviour, or does it just give an account of power? So an example of that might be um, Homer's Odyssey, which is a book that some of you may have encountered, a very famous work, classic of Mediterranean culture, if you will. And it describes the actions of gods and men in the Mediterranean in the 10th or 11th century BC, and the dating is uncertain. And it describes men who hate the gods. They are called the Theonachoi, those who battle the gods. They show their greatness as heroes because they oppose the gods, they stand up to them. And the gods themselves are totally amoral. They behave exactly as men do. They lie, they cheat, they sleep with one another's wives, they fight. There's no moral superiority to the Homeric gods. That is an example of what Weber would call amoral religion. There's nothing in divine behaviour that should suggest to mankind how they ought to behave. It is merely a way of describing a world that seems irrational and driven by chance. So there's, there's a way of imagining that you see the great powers of the elements, and you account for those through the behaviour of gods who look like men. But there's nothing in that account that is, describes anything other than power. Those powerful creatures are not necessarily better than men, they are just more powerful. That is very different, Bailey suggests, from the theologies of um, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, where religion preaches a kind of morality, part of its legitimacy comes from its claim, for it to be true or not, its claim to provide a moral code, provide a better way for people to live. That is not a feature of all religions, Bailey's careful body. Not a feature of all religions, that is something that certain religions innovate at certain points in time. The other, no, the third part of Weber's division between traditional and rational religion is its relationship to magic. One interesting feature that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all share is an antipathy to magic. There's a notion that can be false harnessing supernatural powers by witches and sorcerers is forbidden. That stark definition between good relationship with the supernatural and bad relationship with the supernatural does not exist in many religions. Um, the fourth division that they provide is theology, something we hinted at in our conversation earlier. Um, is there a way, is there a specific domain of philosophy that discusses God? That understands what God is, what God's purpose is, what God wants of the world, what God's nature is, how that nature is related to man. Those are all questions you want to ask if you're concerned with producing a systematized understanding of the world. When we look to this example with the Dinka, we ask the question, did God create a cattle? You don't know. It's not a systematized account of the world. There is God, and there are cattle, and cattle are hugely important to men, and all men's, uh, and among the Dinka, all people's rituals are related to cattle. But we don't know what the relationship is. There's no theology, there's no systematization. Those questions, those dots haven't been, the questions haven't been asked, let alone answered. The dots haven't been joined up. It's very different from our presumptions, as most people grown up in cultures formed by Abrahamic religions, is that religions will be systematized. Is that people will have bothered to ask the questions and try to relate different kinds of moral instructions to others to present systems of rules, and philosophies that underlie those systems of rules. But that is not true of all religions, what Abraham will argue. So he's not using monotheism or Abrahamic as a criterion, but he is dividing religions into two different categories of traditional and rational. Geertz claims that in the 1950s and 60s in Bali, he witnessed the transformation of a traditional religion into a rational religion, and that's what we think he's called. So um, these are the temples on the island of Bali. Um, as you can see, they are not um, swept spaces, they are not maintained. 
Um, you know, normally see mosques and churches with moss growing all over them, and sort of enveloped by the jungle. So the relationship to sacred space is different. And um, Giet uh, sort of sets out three different paths, three, three different ways that the Balinese relate to their religion. And in a sense, he's describing three different clusters of religion that are loosely related to one another, but not very clearly. Um, so the first of these are the village festivals. These take place, um, these are centered around temples on the edge of the villages. But people don't enter the temples, they take place on the, out, the outskirts of the temple. People come to the temple from the village. They tend to be there to ensure the fertility of the paddy fields, that the rice will grow, or that um, or the people will continue to bear children in the village. But the other purpose of these rituals is to endorse a caste system, to make it clear who is a member of which caste in Balanese society. The caste system is not so rigorous as in India. There is certainly no sense of an untouchable caste, but there is a notion of one group is superior to another, and these groups sleep in different roles in rituals. If you so, the categorization uh, is that one side of religion is traditional and the other is rational. That's what they've done. Yeah. yeah. So, does he seem to suggest that all the traditional religions don't have the rational perspective? Uh, that's what you're suggesting. He's writing in the late 19th century. He's writing before political correctness. Um, yes, he's saying one form is more primitive, and one form is more developed. Okay. And now, right now, we are discussing the traditional point of view. Well, we're discussing Geertz's presentation of Balinese religion. And Geertz says, the tradition perspective or well, Geertz is saying that what I'm describing here is more traditional, and he's going to try and describe how this is, becomes rational. Okay. Whether or not you believe him, it's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in this environment, these village festivals, there are very complex priestly rituals that are not comprehended or understood by the vast majority of people. It occurs in a language they find very arcane. And frequently, people don't all attend. These are very important rituals, but it's not that important that everyone is there. The effect of the ritual is what is important. So people, um, it's not necessarily, the focus of this is not an experience that everyone must have. And frequently families are, met, are represented by single members. So an extended family of 25 people, only one of them actually attend the ritual. And they will have holy water sprinkled on them in the course of the blessing. And that will stand for the whole of their family. This is the first aspect of traditional Balinese religion as described by Zitz. Then there are also these official temples, much larger than the small temples outside villages. They are maintained by labour corvettes, by a taxation of labour on the peasantry. The priest comes along, tells the nobility that they want so and so peasants to work the land on their temple or to clear it or to. Um, or, or, to, or to perform some service and maintain the road, for instance. And um, Geertz reads this as a kind of public demonstration of the priestly noble control of Bali. It's a form of maintaining these temples where these rituals occur. He sees it as a kind of conspicuous consumption, demonstrating the primacy of the priests and the nobles over the island of Bali. Um, and he observes that governance in Bali, in traditional Bali, is less to do with what we'd call government, but to do with status distinction. That the proper running of the world is not so much the devising of new policies or innovation, finding new ways of raising taxes and spending money. Governance is about maintaining the order, making sure the priests and the nobles are on top and the peasantry serve them. And he sees this symbolically represented in the official temple system. Again, one can raise critiques, it's modern, but this is what he says. The third um, aspect, strong aspect of Balinese religion, is a set of stories that are enacted through dances, accompanied by a gamelan, by 
a orchestra made of bronze metallophones, bronze instruments. Some of you may have heard this music. Um, has anyone been to Bali? Um, the stories that are told in the Balinese gamelan center around this figure, the Baron. And the Baron is a lion, fairy lion, and he's danced by two people two men, and he represents good, he represents goodness. Um, and he's fought by Ranga, the widow witch, who stalks the paddy fields at night looking for children to eat. And she's got these long fingernails. And in some depictions, her intestines come out of her stomach. You can see all the intestines coming out of the skin. And they have a, and while the back, while the gamelan plays, this music plays, often frenetic music, Randa fights the Baron. They, the um, actors fight on stage and dress as the witch, dressed as the lion. And that's a symbolic representation of good and evil, implicitly perhaps a representation of fertility against infertility. Um, so this is, they're all associated with the paddy fields, so the, the place where Ranga walks is the paddy field outside the village. It's about safe space and unsafe space, an illustration of the eternal tension between famine and fertility in an irrigation economy. And sometimes, I, I've seen this happen, um, members of the audience are possessed and they jump up on stage and start to stamp themselves with knives. Or, while these men carry the crease curved dagger, and they start to stamp themselves. And during, while they're in a possessed state, they don't hurt themselves with their own lives when they're carrying these weapons around. They hurt they don't? They don't hurt themselves. How come? And they're stabbing themselves? I don't know. Okay. Now, um, Geertz observes that we've got these three different clusters of what we call religion. Of Village religion, where individual members of families are blessed by, blessed by the priest, and that stands for the fertility of the whole village. And you've got the official temples, where Geert sees the main function as determining the caste hierarchy. And then you've got these this musical extravaganza, where people are taken over by spirits and the symbol that Geert sees here is this constant contestation between good and evil. So if we, go, if we think again about smart, there is a story. One of these sessions has a story, but they don't all. They don't, there's not much consciousness of a narrative behind most of these, and it's very loose, really, in the Wanda Baron story. It doesn't seem to doesn't have much relationship with any living human beings. Um, is there an experiential component to these? Um, well, there is to the Ranga Baron, undoubtedly. This is extremely exciting, very, very exciting. But mainstream worship at the temple is boring and incomprehensible. No one knows what's going on. And it's, it's, not, it's, it's not considered an experience to most people. Most people don't attend it. And people attend it as a duty. Um, if we go back to Smart's definitions, is there a doctrine and philosophy that underlies these things? Not philosophy in a formal sense. Maybe good, a notion of good and evil, if we call that a philosophy, but only partially and only in one of the cases. Um, no ethical or legal, is there an ethical and legal prescription? Well, the um, official temples, the notion of division of society into castes. There must be an ethical, you know, conduct, code of conduct, no? Well, there is, but it's not endorsed in any of these rituals. It's not endorsed in any of these religious features that Geertz describes. So yes, there is a notion of ethics, there's a notion of good and bad, but I'm not sure, at least as Geertz describes 1950s Bali, it's not endorsed in the religious the accounts we have, or? Well, there are numerous. Yes, there, were, there are other accounts of Bali, but, uh, so, um, but it, in Geertz's description, if we, if we just stick with Geertz for the moment, um, yeah, there's, there's not um, ethics isn't rendered part of religion. 
All of these are sets of rituals, that's important. Um, uh, and they're certainly religious hierarchy, but the hierarchy doesn't impinge on everything. Priests play no role in the round of our own dances. So um, it would seem to be good examples of um, what Weber calls, side, um, what Weber calls segmented religion. This is a, so there are different forms of religion, and they take place simultaneously, and their relationship to one another is loose and attenuated. So this one is segmented. Yeah, yeah, it's with this. So it's the same thing. Are you with me so far? Have I made this clear? I realise this is all new material. None of you've been to Bali, and uh, these are all, he's describing three quite different forms of religious practice. What the, I think the crucial point to take away is they all correspond to different parts of a definition of religion, but they've not been integrated. They've not been integrated with one another. That hasn't happened yet. Geert suggests that what happens in the 1960s is that they become integrated. Those people start to systematize by the So people start to separate of systematizing, systematizing or the priest? Well, that's interesting. Um, as Geert depicts it, it's the people. Okay. It's the people, it's laymen. So it comes from the bottom? Uh, I think it comes from intellectuals. No, maybe not at the bottom. There comes from people who've been educated on other islands, or people who are most exposed to government expectations of what a religion should look like. So, what the important context that you need to know about what happens in 1960s Indonesia is what um, is what the Indonesian government calls the Pancasila, the five religions. It says that all Indonesians should belong to a religion. Yeah. And it says that, there, um, that it's, it's, there's a philosophy that says that only certain creeds qualify as religion. And Islam and Catholic Christianity and Protestant Christianity are undoubtedly included in that. Um, but there is a fear that this is all, um, this is all a reaction to communism. This is a reaction to Chinese communism in Indonesia. So there are, there's a great fear that what will happen in Malaysia would happen in Indonesia. So the Chinese would rise up and enact a communist takeover of most of Indonesia's Punjab. And the government saw the best way of preventing that is encouraging conversion to religion as a way of enforcing social cohesion. Now, this was a, this is a country that's not entirely Muslim by any means. Um, there are large um, uh, polytheist and Christian minorities. So um, what they do is encourage conversion to any religion. But religion, you know, what counts as a religion, is difficult. So large numbers of polytheists convert to Christianity at this point. Um, they've long been opposed to Islam. They've long decided not to be Muslims. Um, lots of these, um, lots of islands have um, feasting cultures based around eating pork. And um, to convert to a religion where pork is banned would be extremely socially disruptive. So a lot of these groups, like the Dayak in, in Borneo, for instance, convert to Christianity at this stage. They have in the past. Um, this is not something that's seen as an option for the Balinese. The Balinese are not, um, uh, though they certainly practice a religion that we call unsystematized, this is an extremely complex religion that's deeply rooted in their own culture. Um, not only is it complex, it's also very well funded. And the Balinese are very conscious of um, wider politics within Indonesia and conscious of a rivalry with Java. Um, so, in a sense, they have different kinds of options than, um, uh, than say, animist groups in central Borneo. Um, uh, among these is consciousness of how their myths and stories are similar to those of India. So, it's sort of in a response to these demands of the Indonesian government, they brand their religion Balinese Hinduism. So, it's a version of the world. Balinese Hinduism. 
Now, it is related to Hinduism, and uh, the Hindu the stories of Hindu India have long been spread in Java, and indeed continue to be widely celebrated by Javanese Muslims. So, Javanese Muslims use the gamelan and tell stories that come from the Ramayana. That's very common. So, stories that derive from Hindu culture are very common, and practices that had derived from Hindu religion had also been very common in medieval Java, pre Islamic Java. Um, so what the Balinese do is consciously align themselves to a world religion in order to be acceptable. Um, at the same time, actually, and many Chinese who don't want to be branded as communists and call themselves Confucian and emphasize the fact that Confucius was a prophet. So therefore, matching an Indonesian Muslim criteria of what a religion is, saying so religion is something that a prophet, well, we had a prophet, it's Confucius, that's okay. Confucianism is not a philosophy in Indonesia, it's a religion. So the Balinese developed for themselves Balinese Hinduism. They term, they term their religion Balinese Hinduism, and they start to define it in monotheistic terms. They start to emphasize the fact that Hinduism has one god, and that all the many gods are just reflections of a one god. So they meet criteria that are acceptable to an Indonesian government. So this was the criteria that you cannot be a polytheist. You cannot be a polytheist, that's right. Yeah. You can be. You cannot. Cannot be. Yeah. If you're a polytheist, you're, um, you're, uh, you're deemed susceptible to communism. So you, you, need, you need strong cultural bulwark against communism. And at that time, the government was Muslim? But yeah, well, I mean, the government in Indonesia is not, it's not an Islamist government. But, but Indonesia is a majority Muslim country. No, no, it is, but the government was influenced by Muslim. Uh, well, um, the government's not influenced by Islamists, but it, I think there are um, Muslim okay. implicit assumptions. I'm assuming it's more about uh, avoiding the communist process. Well, there's, yes, I think that, uh, I, I mean, what is consciously happening is the avoidance of communism. I think the way that people seek to do that and their presumptions about what religion is or what strong religion is are Muslim ones. Um, but there's um, there's problems in simply turning it into Islamic reaction. I think it's more complicated. Than that. Yeah. Of course, some of the people and there there are there is also a Christian voice as well. I think um, Christian definitions of religion in 1960s in Indonesia are quite similar to Muslim ones. Um, so what Geertz witnesses is a set of conversations that occur next to the temple. Why do we do what we do? And to that mind, that he sees as the crucial question. People are asking this question. This is the moment when people are transforming from a traditional religion to a rational one. People are saying, why do we do what we do? It's not assumed that we should do it this way. Other people are telling us we are wrong. We've gone to other places where people do other things. So why do we do it? Why what, things that have been justified merely as custom, as what my father has done, what has to be done, now has to be justified rationally in very different times. I was very struck in Bali when I saw a priest making offerings in front of the people. So he was on an island in a temple surrounded by people. But I could see him from behind, as it were. I could, I could look into the back of the temple. And he walked out of the front with the offerings and prayed before them and lit the incense sticks and did that in front of the people. And then he went round inside the temple, put down the offerings, got a packet of cigarettes out of his robe, and had a cigarette. And I was very surprised, because in a Christian context, you would never get a priest going in front of the altar and then lighting a the cigarette. This would seem very strange that he was doing something that seemed very informal once he was in a private space, even though that private space was in a temple. And it surprised me that then um, the, 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 the boundaries seemed to play such a different role in that context. Um, the conversations that Geertz witnessed, some of them, some people said that this is a kind of materialist, sort of communist um, expression. This one man said, the point of religion is to justify power, and so the priests can keep control of us and use our resources, use our labor. Um, another man said, um, well, religion is an expression of faith. It can't be questioned. 
we have to do it because we, because we believe because we believe in what our parents believe so it's not it's not our pledge to it. someone else said of what we do in public these are social norms this is a kind of Durkheimian position as far as know, it's really important. so what we do in public we are expressing something about our society is a social good but in terms of my relationship with God that's what I do at home so it's differentiating between what goes on in public um, a private spirituality, a private relationship with God. So he's saying there's different features of that. What most people do in public is just about social norms. It's not really private religion, they're different things. It's also reflective, I suppose, of a Sufi or Christian um, way of seeing things, and it's not inconceivable that you might have come into contact with those kinds of ideas. And the fourth one says, well, what we do in Bali is just a matter of custom. I do these things in Bali, but if I'm in Jakarta, I'll do something different. So it's just a question of, of, of where I am. And um, certainly, uh, one thing that surprised me in Indonesia was people would go from uh, Balinese would never eat beef. But when they're in Java, they'd say, Is this beef? And they'd hear their Balinese accent and they'd say, Oh, no, it's not beef, it's pork. And they'll find out eat it. And the same thing happened in reverse with Javanese Muslims would go to Bali and they'd say it's a sport and people would hear their Javanese accent and say no sir it's beef and they'd be happy um, so it's so are they eating it unconsciously no they they haven't I don't know I don't know it's somewhere in between they they probably know that they're being lied to but they want to be lied to they don't actually mind eating pork but they know they're not meant to Well, I don't know. I can only I can only describe what I observed. I can't tell you what was in my mind. This was a personal observation. Well, I'm mixing. Oh, my the observations about pork and beef. Those are my observations. Okay. That's not what you're um, But this rings true that there is a stratum of Indonesians who are familiar with the fact that there are different religions on different islands. They are content with them all. They think all of them are positive social forces. And so they think it's appropriate to follow one set of rules in one place and another set of rules in another place. So that's one way, that's one Indonesian way of thinking about religion. Um, but for Geertz, the fact that these questions are being asked is a function of a rationalizing religion. People are asking these questions, people are asking critical questions, and people are beginning to respond. And one of the things that he noted was the importation of Sanskrit manuscripts and the dissemination of these manuscripts from. Um, Sanskrit and from old Balinese, but Balinese religion was giving itself a history, and the different forms of religious practice were being related to one another in case and system. So he saw those things starting to happen in the 60s, that's what he called this year. Um, so he said that he says that what's crucial, what's a, what kickstarts this systematization is a challenge from outside and a clear set of advantages that accrue to you if you can present yourself in a suitable way. You can present yourself as a systematized religion. And there exists a sort of pool of resources, a pool of ideas that allow you to do that. And that's what he thinks was happening in Bali. And he says you've got enough, you've got enough educated middle class people who have traveled, who have these wide interests, who are able to ask these questions and respond to them. And crucially, I think literacy is a crucial issue. There are enough literate people who are asking these questions, who engage with one another, who can essentially then systematize. These different practices into a single cult, which is Balinese. Does he mention who is taking part in this discourse? Well, he says that there are men sitting on the edge of the temple, and he says there are a mixture of people who've never left home, and a mixture of people, mixture of people who've gone to university elsewhere. Okay. And there's a wider phenomenon, I suppose, that we could talk about. Of. But there are no priests. No. As I remember, this is a conversation without priests. This is a, this is these are these are things driven by laymen. But I think it's not only about the Christ and mm -hmm. I'm like I'm trying to compare this situation with the uh, Muslim community in the Xinjiang province of China. Oh, yes, interesting. Where uh, the communist forces are like suppressing uh, Muslims to offer uh, fast and everything. Right. And I was thinking whether they can switch from the tradition from Islam to the as per the reverence institution to the uh, rational one. 
I think Weber would call it. I think Weber would call um, Islam in Xinjiang rational. Rational. I, yes, I think he would see. I think well, I'm, I'm not sure because he doesn't really write enough about Islam for me to say. Um, I think Weber thinks about all Abrahamic religions as rational. Per se. Don't you think that's a blind spot? But for him to think about them as rational. Yeah, all Abrahamic religions. Well, he's thinking because there are certain practices in almost all of them that cannot be rationally right, defined. Right. Sure. I mean, he's. I mean, he didn't write about Islam thoroughly, so it's, it's hard to say. So, for example, but he's, he uses rational as an antithesis to traditional, and he he, he uses rational to mean systematized. So he, he sees Islam as something that is systematized. So what's not traditional is rational, and what's not segmentized. Yes, I mean, so it's a problematic it's a problematic set of definitions. Certainly, I don't think anyone writing in the twenty first century would use that dichotomy of traditional and rational. So why I was asking about the involvement of priests within this discourse, mm. because even in Pakistan, the middle class people who are educated and who have been abroad and have been educated abroad, mm. who come back and take part in this social discourse, they tend to question so many religious and social practices mm. that have become so closely attached to Islam. Mm. But you know, for the final verdict, mm. they always go to the priest, to the ulmas, mm. the ulmas, because the legal part within Islam is so strong that that discourse cannot take place in isolation of the legal uh, you know, yeah. consultation. Yeah. So whenever they go to the ulmas, the entire discourse falls and whatever the whatever verdicts that particular ulma gives, it has to be accepted with, you know, even if there is a resistance, but it has to be accepted. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking if this was a traditional religion, then from that perspective, Islam within the subcontinent. It can never, you know, take the journey from traditional to rational because the legal verdict that will be given from Ulma it will always remain the same. I would like to think. Yeah. I think in this particular case of Bali, maybe yeah. it was in the interest for priests as well to go from the traditional to the rational yeah. in order to be considered as a religion. Yeah. So maybe in case of Pakistan, whenever are uh, mullahs and ulmas and uh, priests think that moving away from the traditional to the rational will be beneficial for them, mm -hmm. then they might also consider doing it. But right now, it doesn't seem so. Well, I mean, if we compare it to Iran, say, a large number of people who were involved in the constitutional reforms of the 1890s or the 1920s um, were trained as Alims. Large number of people who ended up being trained. Being ended up there was taking. so much. There was so much political influence. Well, they. I mean, so uh, what you propose is not impossible. Yeah. But um, Ulamash decide that they would rather be involved in a reformation or a, you know, if we use that in a general sense, yeah. than um, than clinging to a form they've been trained. And that has certainly occurred in tradition bound societies. Well, for um, example. The reformation part that is taking place within Islam mm -hmm. and within these countries is uh, so insignificant that I think it is next to nothing. For example, uh, there is uh, an ayah in Quran mm -hmm. which says that it is okay for a man to beat his wife yes. uh, if she is not obedient. Mm -hmm. he gives, it gives three uh, conditions that first you forsake the physical relationship, then you beat her lightly. So it's three conditions. Yes. But uh, so over the years, initially, till 17th, 18th century, it was just said in all the translations, if you whenever you read in Urdu, English, or any other language, just to beat. Mm. But if you see all the modern translations, mm. you get to see beat and then lightly in bracket. Right. Just to you know confirm to the Western standards that <laughs> which so, yes. giving rights to women. Yes, yes, yes. So that is the only uh, progress that it's making. You know? That's my point. Yes, I mean, I suppose that is. So there's a wider point about how um, multiple cultures set out general rules that they expect others to adhere to, the rules for what humane behavior consists yeah. of. And um, in a sense, we could see what's happening here in Bali as a subset of that. Um, there is a general set of definitions. Um, religion is good for social cohesion. Religion is a good thing. 
you don't follow a religion, you're communist and that's bad. And this is all religion consists of. So if your religion doesn't consist of this, you better show us how. You've got to prove it. So there's then a vested interest to the Balinese to maintain their culture in the way that they're familiar with, to show how their religion is systematized. Um, and yes, in a sense, that's a um, so that's this is an example here of how general rules can apply to religion, which I'll shift religion as a category. And what you've done, I think, is show a different example of how um, uh, good practice, moral practice, is consists of not eating a wife, say. So that can force people to change Islam. Um, it can force change, it can force a religion to alter it, um, you know, say, actually, this is an appropriate interpretation. Yeah, but you can never remove that particular verse from the Quran. Indeed. And as long as it's there, uh, yes, the people so, who are traditionally following it, who are following it in a literal sense, yeah. will always uh, be inspired by yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. And um, that's something else we'll come across next week. Asman says one of the key features of monotheism is memory. Um, in a traditional religion that doesn't rely on widespread literacy or doesn't rely on a scripture, you can alter them very easily. You can alter myths. So narratives and myths that stimulate human behavior, if situations change, you can alter it. You can say, you just forget it. You can forget the inconvenience. Monotheisms are not so able to forget things that are inconvenient. Sorry, but uh, that's the problem with the case in Indonesia because, in, in, they, in Zika, Zika, yeah. uh, because they have a memory that is already established, which says that the past has to this, mm. and performance to this, mm. this, this, and now they cannot like directly shift from that particular thing to another one, unlike what happened in Barnes, mm. because they didn't have any inscription, so they uh, adopted some else. So scripture, the um, inclination to listen to this and so they affect that thing. Mm. Memory is already existing in Islam, mm. so it, I don't think it will be that easy for uh, Muslims to live in that province to adopt just like the government. So no, indeed. indeed. Um, I agree. Um, I think that, um, well, there are lots of issues that Yates or Bay doesn't address in this, this simple dichotomy. Um, and the simple definite, this simple distinction between traditional and rational, you've already picked a lot of issues there, a lot of problems. I think if we assume that, if we take it for, as granted that this dif differentiation between traditional and rational might not really work in practice, I think we can still take away the general model that for each given period of time, there might be a set of expectations about what religion or civilization consists of a set of criteria against which cultures are judged. And then cultures that are not powerful enough to set the criteria, but are powerful enough to become aware and to transform themselves, can then try and follow the running set by other more powerful cultures. And that might be happening here. Or it might be happening in your example to do with eating. Yeah, for yeah. example, American human rights sets the running for what civilization is. So this right now that you the main clash is between the Saudi version of Islam, mm. the Wahhabis version, which is the most dominant in Islam mm. at the moment, mm. Mm. and the American culture, the Western culture, mm. which people are learning mm. as they are getting exposed to it. Yeah. Mm. So same is the case with the establishment of civilian mosques. They, they are establishing civilian mosques in Northern, Northern America. Yes, kind of it's very uncommon. Yeah. It's extremely uncommon. It's, a lot is written about it, but that is very few. It's very yeah. there have been and the, the women who've all led prayer have all done so in churches. Uh, when Amina would do just led yeah. prayer, it's all been in a church. It's all been Episcopalian churches in New York that have lent a space. Sure. And so it's not yeah. a, it's, it, in, it, it happens, but it's a very um, uh, Minority phenomenon. Um, so that's my um, that's the material I wanted to talk to you about today. I want to keep it relatively light to begin with because some of these ideas are quite difficult. Um, but what I would like to do is go away and read Yeats's article and have a think about it. Um, I've not been I've not concealed the fact I think there are a lot of problems with it, 
I think it's really useful that he registers the fact that definitions of religion can change, and that in response to those definitions, some religions change, but other religions are incapable of changing and lose membership. That's what happens later for the polytheists. Um, that's what I'd like you to take away and um, think about when we approach the next um, lecture, which will be really based around the thought of Yan Aslan and um, his theorization of monotheism. And we're going to talk, among other things, about what happens to people from members of religions that migrate. And he sees the Hebrew Bible and the migration of the Jews as a key example of uh, uh, the ability of monotheism to survive, the unique ability of monotheism to survive migration. So that's what's about next week. So I just want to read one article. Yeah, well, read Gates as article and then look at the other readings for next week as well. Okay. Um, I've set other of other reasons if you have time. And so then now's the beginning of the term. If you if you have a bit of extra time left over and want to catch up on reading for future sessions, please do that. Okay. I've also set two general works at the beginning of my Moodle slide. So I've, well, I've set um, uh, Ninian Smart's book on the world's religions, and I set a book by Peter Berger called The Sacred Canopy, which is really about, yeah, it's really about secularization. Um, so I recommend both those to you. And neither are, I don't intend to use either as textbooks. So the previous version has been a full No, no, I don't, they're full books, so it's okay. illegal for me to upload PDF, so you have to find another one. Um, I would add that um, when I set essays for sacred cross cultures, I ask you to look at two different religious fictions, and um, you need to be careful in how you define this. So I would say, um, I would say two things. One, you need to remember that religious traditions are demarcated in time and space. So I don't want any generalizations about Islam or Christianity. We need to talk about Anglican Christianity in 20th century India, or talk about um, a Sunni Islam in 21st century Chitral. Um, please don't tell me, don't um, produce generalizations about Islam, because in a sense that presumes that all Muslims think the same thing or follow them, so be as precise as possible. Yeah. Um, if you want to say, if you want to make generalizations, you might be much safer saying the Quran says blah blah, blah rather than saying all Muslims think. Yeah. Because, all about the culture. Yes, all Muslims can emphasize different parts of the Quran. The Quran may say some things and all Muslims may safely ignore it. Look, St. Paul says that women should cover their hair in church. We very rarely see women covering their hair in church in England. People safely ignore it. So you shouldn't presume that something is consistent across the entire religious culture. If you wish to make a general statement, preface it with such and such says in the Sunnah and it's widely followed, for instance. So be careful about how you, what, whether you're making a generalization or whether you're talking about something quite specific. Much safer to talk about something specific. I ask you to talk about two religious traditions so that you can invite me to make some kind of comparison from an analysis like that. So I would so I'm looking at Ninian Smart's book might help you think about what other religious traditions you might be looking at. Um, and um, one reason I ask this is both to allow you to use your own experience, so to talk about religious phenomena that you're interested in, or Xinjiang, for instance. Um, talk about Pakistan, I don't mind but also to force you to make some kind of comparison to another situation. Um, but I leave all my, my, all my questions are asked to be quite open. I'm going to post my, all the exam questions to the term after the middle, so that you'll mid term for any questions. Do you have any questions for me? When will be the first essay due? Um, uh, just after the reading. Reading week. Mm -hmm. So after fifth week, we'll have a week of holiday. Mm -hmm. And that will be 2,000 words. So that's minimum or? That's maximum. Maximum. And there's no minimum. It would be foolish to write 200 words. Yes, 2,000 words maximum. But I'll set, I'll set out the criteria in the, there'll be a document. So don't rely on what I'm saying now, but I'll look at the document I sent out. I'll, I'll post it on the board and I'll be happy to work. Sure. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed your first week. Yeah. Um, but it's not done yet. We try to keep it quite light, just you know, to, you know, so that you don't sink. Let you stay. But I would say is try and speak in English.
they could be with the parties. And if people around the course you don't speak over, you don't exclude them. Um, so imagine it feels like if you're coming to a room and everyone's speaking a language you don't understand, it's much harder to break into that kind of conversation. So if you speak in English, you make yourself open to someone else making sense of you. Yeah. Thank you.